So without further ado, let me go ahead and pass the mic over to uh, Becca for her talk called Proxy in a Haystack, Uncovering and Classifying Multi-Factor Authentic Authentication Bypass Phishing Attacks and Large-Scale Authentication Data. Thank you. I'm trying to compete for the longest title. So. Um, hi, as you said, my name is Becca. Um, I work for Duo Security. We're part of Cisco Secure, um, and I primarily work on threat detection within authentication data, particularly MFA authentication data. Um, also, I want to shout out our intern, Lauren, who joined us this summer from Stanford. Without her work, none of this would have happened. So, uh, With that, I'm going to talk a little bit about phishing, particularly the evolution of MFA phishing, how it's changed over the last few years, and particularly the, this, this cat and mouse game. As the attack gets easier for attackers to deploy, it gets harder and harder for us to detect. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about some of the data enrichment that we try to do to get us more labeled instances of this attack. Uh, and then because this is an ML conference, we did some ML and it kind of worked. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about phishing. So this is you, you're a user and you're ready to log in and show up to work. Uh, if you're like me, that means you walk 15 feet to your office in your house. Um, and this is your adversary and they wanna get your credentials. So they're gonna go ahead and send you an email that says, please click here to see changes regarding your compensation plan. You are very interested in what's going on. So of course you click and it takes you to a login page. Um, now this is probably gonna be like a static login page where the attacker is just trying to collect credentials, right? Um, let's assume for the sake of this example that they know that you're using MFA, they know that they need to get an OTP code from you, so they ask you for it. And you go ahead and you open your, your Authenticator app and you provide your six digit, six digit OTP code and this isn't unexpected for you. you. You use MFA all the time, so you're expecting to have to give up this code. Now the attacker at their leisure can go ahead and log into your Authenticator. In this case, we're just using Duo as the example, that's where we work, um, but this can apply anywhere. They go ahead and complete the MFA and then they're all set, they're logged in and suddenly you're very sad because you're like, well, I used MFA, I did my annual security training. I don't know like what I did wrong. Um, maybe if I just never use a passcode again, I will be safe. Um, spoiler alert. <laughs> so enter MFA bypass phishing. Um, so as I'll show you, it's it's a means of not just capturing credentials or static codes, it's actually a mean of proxying an entire authentication through which the attacker can capture everything, all of the cookies, credentials, codes, anything uh, that happens, and it will subvert all but a few MFA methods. So same story, this is you, but you're gonna be better this time. You're gonna use, let's say, do a push, a push-based authenticator. Uh, the attackers also changed their methods. So as we said, instead of a static site, they've set up this proxy server. It's on IP 1234 and they've mapped it to their phishing site. So if you're expecting to log in on duosecurity.com, let's say this is duo-security.net, um, you're probably not even gonna notice that. You go ahead and click, and this time, instead of being taken to a static phishing page that the attacker has built for you to collect credentials, they are instead going to just initiate a connection with your authenticator and immediately proxy the entire flow. So you're gonna complete your login as expected. Once again, they're going to receive your credentials, but the kicker here, at the end of this authentication, they're also going to receive the cookies from your authenticator so they can do whatever they want. And then they're gonna kick you back to whatever website they wanna send you to. Um, these tools are open source, they're free. They take about five minutes to set up depending on what you're trying to do. You just have to install Nginx and write a YAML file. Um, so you said we weren't gonna use passcodes anymore, so it's a big deal. Uh, let's say we're gonna use push. So our user gets to the login page, and again, because this is being proxied, they see the exact same login page that they're expecting to see. They see the option to select, you know, send me a Duo push. Duo sends them a push. The good news is this happens out of band of the attack server. It's gonna go directly to your phone that you've registered with Duo. You accept the push, because why wouldn't you? You asked for it. <laughs> that goes back to Duo. And then Duo sends the cookies to the attacker. Um, Duo never has a connection with you at all. They have a TLS connection this entire time with the attacker. So once again, the attacker gets your cookies and you are very, very sad. <laughs> You're like, but I didn't use a passcode. I don't know what I did wrong. And I wanna like give a preface here because we're an authentication company and this doesn't mean that MFA is completely obsolete. Um, there are factors that will prevent this, specifically anything involving WebAuthn in which 
you and your authenticator are cryptographically bound and will only accept authentications from the origin to which that authenticator is registered. It's not the point of this talk. I just, I don't want you to, you know, leave here and think that my face completely dead. Um, but we have a lot of customers who can't adopt WebAuthn, right, just yet. They may not have laptops that are compatible with, say, Touch ID. They may not be able to use YubiKey. And we don't just want to leave them in the dust. We want to be able to have some way to detect that this is happening. <laughs> but if you can maybe guess by nature of this, um, this gets really, really hard to detect. Uh, specifically, because it's a proxy, when you initiate the connection with the attacker, who then initiates the connection with the authenticator, they pass along your entire user agent string, everything about you. And so your authenticator, the server, is going to see the same OS and browser that they expect to see from you. Um, you as the user, in contrast to a classic phishing site in which you're maybe taken to a site that the attackers had to build, it may have misspellings, um, you're going to see the exact same login flow that you always see. I have a demo of this. I was hoping to do a live demo but we actually patched some stuff client side. So now it doesn't work as well, <laughs> which is great for us, but bad for my demo. Um, but just trust me, the user sees the exact same login flow that they're used to. In fact, the only difference is really the URL, right? The attacker still had to register some fake site, but we did this on our own employees, about 70 of them who knew they were part of a phishing experiment and 40 of them did not check the URL <laughs> and they work for a security company. So um, it's not the user's fault. Um, and then the attacker set up, and this is kind of the most important part in, in my mind, is the attacker has gone from needing to build a full-fledged website to collect your credentials to literally spinning up a free EC2 instance, installing Nginx, and running this pre-built open source tool. Uh, so that's pretty spooky. The only signal that we will have that anything really strange or unusual is happening is the IP address. Because again, if you remember, the IP address that we will see is the attack server. That is what we see as the user during this whole instance. So is it actually meaningful if the user's IP changes? Um, I know it's like right before lunch, but does anybody want to guess how many IP addresses a user uses in the span of just two weeks? I heard seven and then I heard 30. Uh, okay, it's 18 IP addresses and about four and a half different ASNs, so your network carrier. Um, and this has just increased as we've gone more and more hybrid. So a user's IP address changing isn't really meaningful, except when we consider how this attack has to be set up, right? So in order for the attacker to run this proxy server, they have to host it somewhere. And in order to get you to click on it to go to their proxy server, they have to have a domain. And that means somewhere there's a DNS record of this domain pointing to this attack server. Um, and the idea here is like, can we take authentications that we have, the IP addresses that we see as the source IPs, see if they correlate with any phishing domains via like some reverse lookup, and then use that to gather signals about what these attacks look like in our data. Okay, enter Farsight DNS query data. So Farsight has these really nice monthly and daily dumps of DNS data records. We have A records and C name records. Um, so we have host names that point to IP addresses, and we have host names that point to other host names. Uh, there's two problems here before we can go ahead and just like line this up with our auth log data. The first is that we need to unfurl all of these potentially infinite recursions of host name to IP and then host name to other host name. So you could have domain A points to IP 1234 and then a thousand domains that point to domain A. And this is really important because most of the time we saw that the domain in the A record was actually like a load balancer or something completely meaningless. The other problem is that this table was the size of the whole internet. It was every DNS query record for an entire month over the whole internet. It was two terabytes. <laughs> and I think my director is here. Hi, Brian. I'm sorry about the AWS bill. <laughs> um, okay. And I call this out. The talk is not about this problem specifically, but like this is actually what we spent most of our time trying to figure out. And it could be its own like data engineering talk, but it was worth calling out. Um, and that's how we felt <laughs> trying to solve this. Okay. So let's assume for the sake of not spending an hour here that we solve those problems. Now we have our off log records, which are, you know, records in our off log of completed authentications where we have a username, we have the IP that they authenticated from, and we have the timestamp. 
So we're able to line up and say, okay, there's an IP in our database. It matches an IP that we see in the Farsight records. And it happened in between the window of time where that DNS query would have been occurring when that DNS record was valid. So we can go ahead and generate a list of IP domain pairs that we can then evaluate to see which of them we think are phishing domains. And this is actually slightly incorrect because as I said, we would want to include all of the intermediate like CNAME domains as well. Um, this one. So this is kind of the goal, right? We have authentications. We have this DNS enrichment data from Farsight. We want to generate a list of domain IP pairs, and we want to then generate a data set of true positive labeled phishing attacks that we know to be phishing attacks of this exact nature. From there, we can then pull out attack signatures and maybe train a classifier. <laughs> but as we've heard in other talks, like labels are a significant problem. So that's really the, the key goal here. There's just one problem, which was in just two weeks of data, we had 21 million unique IPs, which amounted to 300,000 <laughs> unique do domains. Um, and almost none of them were actually phishing domains. Like a lot of them were benign proxies. A lot of them were proxies people were using to like subvert government censorship. Um, a lot of them were porn. <laughs> a lot of them were people's personal websites. Um, so we have to figure out a way to sift through these and find what do we think are the actual phishing domains. So the first thing we did was two really simple filters um, just to kind of trim the fat. Um, so first we eliminate any domains that have edu or gov. We can pretty much like trust that those are not going to be phishing domains. And then we remove any domains that are older than one year that have a that have a timestamp going back further than really the past year. Um, and that's based on just kind of intuition. Most phishing sites live for about like eight to 15 days total. We also looked at the user behavior behind the IP addresses that these domains mapped to. So in general, if we saw a IP that mapped to a domain, but all the auths from that IP were like maybe one or two users with really consistent behavior, we know that doesn't match the signature of like a phishing attack, which is typically going to be like one and done. From there, we did two sort of selects to split out and find other phishing domains mainly looking for fish hints like login, cache, quick, off, all those things. Um, and then looking for domains that had brand names or specifically misspelled brand names. So one or two letters off, we consider that to be a misspelling of a common brand name. And this got us to 14 domains, which was way better than 300,000. So we're feeling a lot better. <laughs> okay. And I put them up here. <laughs> Please don't go to them. I don't know which of them are still alive. Um, but... It, the, the cool thing is looking at actually the, the ASN that they correspond to. We see a lot of like free hosting providers and the prevalence of DigitalOcean is, is no accident. Um, Evil Jinx, the open source tool that you can run this on, gives you a coupon code for DigitalOcean. <laughs> so <laughs> I really thought this was kind of cool. Um, so we see a lot of like Microsoft impersonation, these like Microsoft.aptaccount.cloud URLs. Uh, we see a lot of traffic from this USPS impersonator. It's probably the tech scam that every single one of you have gotten. Um, we saw a lot of university tooling. So if you can't read these, it's like free Gradely and like a website to help you move out of your dorm. We evaluated these in May. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then my personal favorite was Starbucks. <laughs> um, okay, so we have our list of domains, which means we have a list of IP addresses. We have a list of users that were impacted by these phishing attacks. So for each of those users, we pull all of their authentications from the year 2023. We label the ones from the phishing IPs as malicious. And this gets us 77 malicious auths and 12,561 benign auths. And if you're like a pure ML practitioner in the room, you're looking at this and you're like, this is garbage. What are you going to do? And I'm looking at it and I'm like, I have 77 true positives. And before I had zero. So this is a good day. Um, so from this, we take all these auths and we generate some features. Uh, the first is a set of probabilistic features. So looking at a rolling sort of probability using the user's prior 90 days of authentications to the authentication we're currently evaluating. We have the probability of the access IP's state and country. Um, we also look at the network MFA factor and operating system as it pertains to the application that they're trying to log into. We also have some contextual uh, features that we look at. So namely, has the ASN changed since their prior authentication? Just looking at if they're shifting networks, um, deviating from their normal behavior. 
Whether the ASN and specifically the IP address are new within a user's organization in the last 24 hours, and then the inverse of that, whether or not someone within a different organization has used that IP in the last 24 hours. And then again, another, I don't know if you can see this, looking at the distance between an authentication's lat and long and the average distance between the last 10 authentications. So really just looking for like sharp deviations from their typical behavior. So we see, we try to look at these kind of holistically and see which of these give us the best kind of split between benign authentications and phishing authentications. Um, and for these two, we see some promising signal, but as you can see, users are really weird. <laughs> Still a lot of benign authentications, but a probability is near zero. Um, even for like the state that you're authenticating from, users move around a ton, they use a lot of VPNs. There's a lot of like very benign reasons for their location to be kind of weird. Um, and when we look at these kind of split at a Boolean level, if we're looking at the distance between your auth and your last 10 auths, we see again, a nice split. Um, we see an even better split on whether or not the IP was used within the last 24 hours at a different organization. <laughs> If we were to build a detector on this, it would have like perfect recall and just garbage precision, which brings me to my next section <laughs> of what our precision is. And before I show the numbers, I want to remind you, I put these numbers in my paper and you still invited me to talk here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we have a recall of about like 0.6 2.7, depending on how we tune it. And we were tuning it for recall, and that's because we're trying to solve an authentication security problem. And so in general, what we hear from customers is that they're not super sensitive to false positives. They would rather make sure that we're catching as much true positives as we can. I also have asterisks here, the precision numbers, because A, we have this huge base rate like issue, right? We have billions of offs per month. Maybe a dozen of them will actually be malicious. Um, and also these were evaluated only on the features that I outlined, not things that we would have in real time, like whether or not the auth was from a remember device, um, from a Wi-Fi fingerprint that we've seen before, from a trusted network that the customers configured, right? All of these things would only bring up that precision. <laughs> so with that, this is still how I feel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the good news or what I will tell myself is that it, like a perfect classifier was never actually the goal, right? The goal was for us to find a more reliable way to label attacks from this sort of unknown, complete unknown space. And I think we've done that, right? Like the goal eventually is for us to have a repeatable way where we can collect threat signals, apply them to the authentications we have, use that to train and test real-time classifiers, and then hopefully detect threats in real time. What we're doing now looks more like this, um, in which we have over a billion auths per month. We have some detection rules, heuristics-based things that are evaluating that in real time and getting us some useful information. But again, we don't have any labels off that. We don't have a great way to know when we make a rule or a detection, whether or not it actually stopped an attack, right? Um, we have an anomaly detection product that gets it right 5% of the time, but that's very subjective because we're asking customers to label those events for us. Customers are very subjective. You could ask two different admins within the same company to label the same event and they would give you different answers. Um, we also have an unknowable number of false negatives. So <laughs> the goal here was not for us to have perfect precision. It was for us to find threat signals. And this was actually the goal, right? This gets us a way to look and hunt for more instances of this attack to find that doing this kind of targeted domain sifting gets us actual real actionable signals um, and hopefully bring us closer to this. So we have these true positives that we can find from this domain driven hunting. We have true positives from our rule based detections that we can dig into. And then we're also expanding to work more with our friends at Talos uh, over at Cisco um, to continue to, to collect better threat signals and apply them to our offs so that we can train and test actual classifiers and hopefully come back next year with precision above 5%. Okay. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. Really great talk. Uh, we have some time for questions. I'm happy to go. Um, thank, thanks, Becca. I, and, and I love the uh, genuine self and humbleness. So, so uh, uh, th this may be outside the talk. Um, if if the goal is to get better labelings, mm -hmm. 
Um, do you have the ability, uh, presumably without interfering with the customer experience too much, to do any kind of active probes and tests, right? So in your fun little diagram, you could at some uh, high random or uh, pseudo random interval um, bump this, check this, uh, require second authentication, which which gives you more of those signals and may help you filter domains. I, I don't know if that's something in, in scope. Yeah, so the like, you know, requiring a second authentication is what our real time detectors do um, in terms of generating more labels in the process there. That's that's really like what we're working towards. So the idea here is just another source of intelligence. And then we are actually starting to hand label instances ourselves. Um, when we need to, we reach out to customers. But in general, yeah, we've started manually undertaking that process. Uh -huh. Thanks. Um, so a lot of the user features that you talked about were, they seemed like they're specific to an organization where you'll need to train uh, on data that you've collected from one org, right? And that model won't work for another org. But then you mentioned working with outside threat research. So my question is, the features that you're building that would work across multiple orgs, is that something like specific IP addresses and on other indicators of compromise? Or is that like higher fidelity behaviors that you're seeing? Mm -hmm. And if it's something like that, can you just, I'm curious, can you give me an example of something like that? Yeah, so our goal is to move away from per customer hyper-specific models and towards this kind of more generalized model, which is why those features are really specific to the user. So they'll translate across customers. Um, in terms of the threat signals that we're looking at, yeah, it's like malicious IP feeds that we can get. Um, it's true positives that we have from like maliciously registered devices. And then those give us like a lot of insights into all the authentications that came from that device. Um, we work with Talos to identify like potential threat groups, government groups, things like that, just for us to track, um, as well as having them kind of work with us to improve our detection mechanisms. I don't, does that answer your question? Okay. On that topic, I was curious if you looked at what actions users took when they authenticated to sort of solve that problem. Because if a user logs in, looks at bank account, logs out, that's different from a user who logs in, registers new MFA, changes the root password, hmm. that sort of thing, logs out to sort of root out that uh, false, you know, to sort of bring that precision down a little bit. Yeah, so because we're... The second factor, we don't really see any activity that happens after they log in. We can see them registering new MFA devices. Um, for a lot of these attacks, that didn't quite happen, but that is like a real big indicator of compromise for us is like an indicator successfully completes MFA and then registers a new authenticator device. We didn't see that here. And unfortunately, we can't see things like password changes, really. We don't have that telemetry yet. Um, most of what we saw, it was like one off successful authentications across users, across many different customers. It was like very broad attacks. I think we have some uh, questions on the Slack channel. And there's also a very funny meme on the Slack channel. It says Starbucks on a uh, Star Starbucks coffee cup. Um, so what features did you use in the final classifier? Uh, all the ones that we talked about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then another question related to the outputs is that uh, ML models oh. output probabilities uh, between zero and one. Have you thought about filtering out probabilities near the middle, say around 0.4 or 0.6, and calling those uncertain? That might actually improve the precision of recall. That's a good idea. I will say like a thing that we're building now is very simple, like real-time detection just based on the mean of those probabilistic features that we talked about and looking for like ranking the very low events. But yeah, that's a good idea to just sift out the, the middle ground. Any last questions? I think there's one. Okay, if there's no other questions, then we could go ahead and give Becca a round of applause.